about briefly about the ideology of disability, um, how disability is perceived, and how you can um, make ideology more accessible for people with disabilities. And I focus mainly on visual impairment. Um, that came about because I was approached by Bucks Vision, a visual impairment charity in Buckinghamshire, to run a pre history workshop for some of their visually impaired members of the working age group. So, um, the people that are currently not employed um, but are of the age group where they could be. Um, so, it started to prompt me towards travelling towards my goal of making archaeology a lot more accessible um, for those with disabilities. Um, I've always been around people with disability. Uh, my brother's hard of hearing and it's um, pretty much something that I feel could be made accessible um, with a little bit of effort. Okay. So, with, when looking at the literature in, the, um, in regards to the archaeology of disability, um, I came up against um, the context of the information that we were um, that was being provided. So a lot of it is from the skeletal records, and um, and certain disabilities aren't shown in skeletal records. So um, it was hard to infer attitudes um, of the society at the time based purely on that. Um, also um, got the see burial records as well um, and I did discover some literature that suggests that if people developed um, the disability later in life once they'd have a chance to actually um, assimilate themselves within the community uh, it appeared that they were a um, very more um, in an inclusive setting with people who didn't have disabilities. Um, Um, so, obviously our interpretation greatly affects this um, and the fact that people were, that there is evidence of disability there and that people were able to survive after having um, trauma that created it um, may have allowed them to survive but it didn't necessarily mean that they were treated nicely. Um, <laughs> So, in a lot of the literature, I looked quite a bit at uh, leprosy, that came up quite a bit, um, and it was a case of ostracising people rather than actually treating them. Um, so, I think we need to be cautious um, when looking at the skeletal record. Um, I also looked into infanticides, not a particularly nice topic, but um, and there were some studies which uh, created the, um, suggested that it was because of the disability. And there was the flip side where um, there were other factors involved. Um, so we need to be really careful about our interpretations with regards to this. I did find a study by Louise Bragg uh, about the um, Icelandic sagas, uh, where physical impairments seem to be more commonplace um, and more accepted and even sort of looked up to as well. So it's really important not to place our own attitudes um, in regards to um, the past in general on when we make um, interpretations. So the 1995 Disability Discrimination Act serves to provide legislation that obliges the employer to make reasonable adjustments in line with what is practical and financially possible within their budgets. However, reasonably um, reasonable adjustments are still at the discretion of the employer. Um, so I did look into Phillips and Creighton's investigations um, in the archaeological workplace um, and that highlighted awareness was vital, um, not just in the immediate um, colleagues but also across all staffing levels and it was important that the working environment was created so the individual felt safe. 
and able to declare the disability and had flexible working conditions. Um, also, another thing that was highlighted was uh, the individual self-awareness of being able to fulfil their roles. So this would um, include gaining an understanding of what's required in the archaeological role before they're actually committed to that. So I would argue that there needs to be more access for people with disabilities or, and people in general at community level to gain an understanding of the various roles and what may suit them. So this is just a brief section about uh, visual impairment. There are 1.8 million adults in the UK living with sight loss. Uh, around 80,000 of them are working age and 25,000 of them are children. Um, the Wilberforce Trust um, stated that 50% of all sight loss is preventable um, and it is expected that by 2050 the number of adults with visual impairment would double to around 4 million. Um, according to the World Health Organization, across the globe there are 314 million people who have a visual impairment and around 45 million of them are blind. Um, so there's the Global Initiative uh, Vision 2020 which is coordinated by the World Health Organization to um, help try and um, reduce levels of sight loss and the UK has its own vision strategy implemented by the RNIB which aims to um, improve eye health, eliminate avoidable sight loss, deliver support for people with sight loss and promote inclusion and participation so they can lead independent lives. So this is just the four main eye conditions in the UK. You've got age-related macular degeneration, which is degeneration of the macula at the back of the eye. Um, causes are unknown, but you um, become more susceptible as you get older. <coughs> You've also got glaucoma, which is due to um, changes in eye pressures. Uh, diabetic retinopathy uh, is where blood vessels become blocked and hemorrhage in your eye. And then cataracts, um, affects the lens in the eye. Uh, as you get older, the lens can become drier. Uh, you can remove the lens and implant an artificial one. So, now on to the workshop. So the aims of the workshop was to provide the participants with a chance to um, travel through time, so to speak, in an immersive workshop. So they had um, smells and tastes of the prehistoric periods and also the opportunity to handle genuine archaeological collections and gain an understanding of what knowledge is required to manufacture stone tools and artefacts as well as uh, find out what's meant by prehistory and what defines them in terms of the um, archaeological footprint <coughs> behind. So the challenges we faced were to make it accessible for uh, the participants. We had participants ranging from um, partially sighted so they could see um, colours and, and, and shapes um, all the way up to no vision at all. Um, so it was obviously important to make sure it was safe. Uh, we had a replica sword that we passed around which um, and the flint tools were quite sharp as well so we needed to ensure that that was safe for them. Um, and it's also appropriate to um, pitch the workshop at an adult level because quite often with um, disabilities it's oversimplified and it doesn't need to be. Okay. So the first section of the workshop was artifact <coughs> handling. Um, I provided an outline of the periods uh, by describing them in terms of the climate, the resources and the strategies that they utilised um, um, that we know from what we've interpreted from the archaeological record. I also used um, scents from Dale Air, um, you know, little um, cubes um, of different smells. So we used wood smoke, um, iron smelting and melted barley and forest. So these were all passed around and 
with the artifacts and the artifact, um, the participants were asked to describe them and uh, suggest what they could have been used for. And they were given the opportunity to ask any questions that they wanted. Okay, section two, we spoke about what food was available um, and the subsistence strategies that, the, um, that may have been used. Um, we also discussed um, how we know about past diets, so we discussed middens, animal bones and um, various butchery marks which they could actually feel on some of the bones which um, I was able to pass around. Um, we used case studies to illustrate the points made, so we used Scarborough Bray um, as well as an excavation at St Dunstan's Church in Monks Winsborough in 2013 where I was responsible for the zooarchaeological assemblage. Um, we also spoke about charred remains, seeds, lipid analysis, um, and they asked any questions that they wanted to. They were able to taste um, some of the recipes, which was very mixed. Um, I made a kind of bread thing, which was really hard to do. Um, yeah, and they had uh, an accompanying booklet, which they had the recipes in, should they wish to make it at home for their families. I, I very much doubt any of them did, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the last section of the workshop was um, replica creation and artifact biography. Uh, we're running out of time in this session, but the plan was to discuss the value of replicas and how artifacts have their own biography. So we used air drying clay to create an artifact based on those that they'd handled earlier or to use uh, the, them as a springboard for creating their own artefact. Um, they only had a small amount of clay, so obviously they couldn't make a full-size uh, Bronze Age sword. Um, and I was tempted to get them to think critically about replicas and that some items are not accessible to them um, due to recommendations around handling, which means that replicas are vital to make archaeology accessible, specifically for visually impaired people. <coughs> So the feedback from the workshop, it was warmly received, they really enjoyed being able to um, get to grips with the artefacts, um, which normally they wouldn't be, have the opportunity to do. Um, one of the participants commented on the um, use of sense as a springboard for their imagination, so it really helped them to complete the images that I was trying to convey using the raw materials and the artefacts and the sense and the foods. Uh, quite often scent is not utilised when working with the visually impaired, however it can provide lots of information about the environment and even be used to recognise individuals. It was suggested that due to the nature of the workshop in stimulating all the senses it would be appropriate for other disabilities as well. Most of the participants highlighted the chance to handle the artefacts as being the, their favourite part of the session. Um, yeah. Uh, we had quite a few, um, not negative, but um, they, they didn't like the food, really. <laughs> <laughs> so, recommendations from my experience. Um, for working with those with visual impairment, you need to be aware of how they, um, what challenges they face and how they access the world before you can focus on making in my case, workshops or um, in an archaeological workplace, the working environment more accessible. Um, a fundamental factor when working with those with sensory impairment is engaging the individual's other senses to create as full a picture as possible. Um, in terms of an individual with disabilities uh, taking on an archaeological role, I would agree that they need to have more access to gain an understanding of what's involved before um, committing an, in either a commercial or a professional setting. Um, and I believe this starts at community level, so it's vital that accessibility is made a standard across archaeology, not just at a professional level. 